All right. Um, so I'm going to go over uh, current evidence on concussion prevention. And then Carl is going to take over and talk about his time with the care consortium and kind of talk to you guys about what he has seen as someone um, that's really participated in data collection of probably one of the most impressive database cohorts. So again, we're not going to be going over treatment and management, but I did want to include these in case you uh, wanted more information on that. There is a new clinical practice guideline just published this year that can help you with that. And then there's still the uh, 2016 consensus statement as well. Again, I'm going to go over concussion prevention efforts, and then Carl is going to go over his time researching the, or part of the research team for the CARE Consortium, and we'll go over what that is as well. So as far as helmets, uh, we're not going to beat around the bush. There's pretty much inconclusive evidence that they're effective in reducing risk of concussions. Um, more specifically, uh, they looked at proper fitting, and in uh, for our ice hockey youth, they did find that there's some association with decreased severity and duration of concussions. So right now, the current consensus is that proper fitting is important, um, also from catastrophic injuries as well. There seems to be no difference in risk compensation. So a lot of people argue, well, if you play with a helmet, you're going to play a lot more aggressively. But uh, in the systematic review done by Emory in 2017, there was one study that looked at that, and they mentioned that there was no uh, risk compensation seen. There was no risky behavior. Next is uh, padding allocation. So there seems to be inconclusive evidence on this as well. Uh, they looked at different uh, or effects of concussions based on where you put the pad in football helmets. So they looked at helmets with more padding in the mandible area. Um, one study showed that there was up to greater than 50% decrease in reduction um, or decrease in concussion risk. Whereas another study showed that there was increased risk there. And then you're all familiar with the rugby and soccer headgear. Uh, but that also has some inconclusive evidence as well on uh, the effectiveness to reduce concussions. But they're still useful. As many as you know, uh, concussion is just one thing we try to uh, avoid with these things, but uh, they can still help with protecting from catastrophic head injuries. And then they've been shown effective to decrease the amount of fractures and such. Next is mouth guards. So the theory with mouth guards is that um, so basically you have uh, something in your mouth that increases both space and uh, when you, whatever it's made of can also dissipate forces. So let's say you get hit in the jaw, um, those forces are gonna dissipate into the mouth guard before they reach the brain. So that's the theory behind it. <clears throat> but there's no strong evidence that mouth guards decrease concussion risk either. Um, there was a kind of big study in BJSM that showed there was up to like a 64 to 70 percent decrease in injury risk, but uh, in the discussion of that, their method was really, did you get a concussion? And then if they did, their, their question was, were you wearing a mouth guard or no mouth guard? But they didn't really account for what kind of mechanism was with it. Were they getting hit into the board? Was someone body checking them? Um, they didn't check if the whatever league that the youth hockey players are playing in uh, had body checking policies. So although there was a correlation and association with it, there's a lot of uh, things that they didn't independently analyze. Um, looking at off the shelf versus custom fitted in that same study, they found that off the shelf was just as effective as custom fitted. Um, like I said, there's a lot of research flaws with mouth guards, and it's not the fault of the researchers. It's just something hard to do. Um, well, a lot of this is going to be based on recall bias of people using it, and how you ask the question is going to affect it too. So a lot of players will say they wear a mouth guard, but they didn't start wearing the mouth guard until after they had a concussion. So that can affect how we look at research and the data we have as well. They have been proven to decrease facial injuries and dental injuries. Therefore, the benefits of wearing them is still recommended. Next is collars. This is a uh, newer technology. Uh, this is more, this is actually called um, jugular vein compression. Um, so the theory behind this is kind of like BFR. You're occluding the jugular vein to a mild extent. And uh, by doing that, you're, increase, you're increasing certain fluids of the, um, within the skull. And they're saying that once you get hit or like a whiplash injury, those forces can dissipate into that extra fluid rather than into the brain. Um, and that's the theory behind it. It's called the brain slosh theory. 
um, and it's an inside out approach. So you're helping the structures inside the brain um, rather than getting something outside the uh, head to protect the brain. And you must be wondering where the heck did they come up with this? Well, sadly, they, um, it, just so you guys know, it's about 100 Gs to um, create a concussion and they put 900 Gs to little rats and they uh, looked at um, neuroimaging and biomarkers of the brain. And um, the reason they're, they're still studying this, and honestly, I am skeptical of everything, but I think this is admirable they're looking into. I think it's, uh, it's pretty cool is uh, one study looked at a functional MRI of the brain and their theory is that uh, white matter does a lot of brain, brain processing. So if you look at uh, how white matter is after hits, that can tell you how well something protects the brain. So um, one study looked at um, activation of certain parts of the brain through functional MRI with a memory task. So they had them in the functional MRI doing a memory task. And then um, they had two groups, one that had the collar on and then collar off. And this is a whole, this is over a season. And at the end of the season, the group with this collar on, they found that um, they had greater uh, memory activation than the other group. So they were able to function a little bit better in that sense. And then Myers was a study before that, but they looked at tissue quality um, using a functional MRI as well of white matter using a lot of biomarkers. And they also found that the group with the collar had um, better tissue quality and biomarkers in the group that used the um, the collar and this was the same cohort so I think it was the same exact method and um, group that they studied. Um, so saying that they didn't measure they, there has been no measure of um, so as you can see here they did an ultrasound and that's how you get fitted too for this collar uh, they make sure they put it around you and then they did an ultrasound right above it and they'll look at the compression of the jugular vein um, but they never did any studies on concussion risk because obviously you need a huge cohort to do that but right now these are the current studies out and uh, Cincinnati Children's Hospital is one of the main institutions that is uh, doing these studies. But like I said, there's no strong support just because the, they haven't done any of the research uh, directly looking at concussion risk yet. Um, other avenues for this is vision training. Um, so if you guys aren't familiar with stroboscopic goggles, um, they basically take information away as someone is doing something and they, in the uh, systematic review, it mentioned that there was an 85% risk reduction using vision training. Um, whether that's because of the brain's ability to, maybe something was fortified in the brain with this training, or it was less contact. But I, I was thinking about whether, let's say they trained with vision training so they could better uh, move out of the way or uh, react to certain things. But how does that change play? What if they're missing tackles because they're just getting less concussions? Or what if they're... Um, going down right away rather than uh, taking on contact. So uh, vision training has been shown to be a risk reduction, but I don't know what the mechanism is yet. Um, as far as safety campaigns and technical work, um, uh, they looked at the heads up campaign in tackling and they found that once uh, that did not seem to have a risk reduction in concussions. However, just having the presence of a uh, a safety coach there seemed to have it. So I think the campaign itself didn't actually help because people will go back to whatever they want to do. But I think having Big Brother kind of spy on you and making sure there's some surveillance there for safety, I think that seems to be the biggest factor in um, doing this. And then they looked at, uh, I believe it was rugby players who had uh, technical proficiency training that was extra, but they found that the ones that had concussion injuries, uh, there was no difference between those who went through extra training versus did not as far as tackling goes. So again, it shows that you can give them tackling drills, but it doesn't mean they're going to um, adapt to it, nor are concussions going to be uh, decreased. Next is environment and surroundings. They've shown that there was no difference. They tried to, they looked at the international hockey um, rinks, which are bigger. So they're thinking people can gain more momentum during hits, um, but there's actually no difference in smaller sizes versus larger sizes. There was a 57% risk reduction with flexible boards versus uh, non or rigid boards in hockey. The, the biggest evidence we probably have for uh, decreased concussion risk is gonna be rule changes. Uh, and this is, can be seen in hockey. They've shown that uh, for uh, looking at surveillance, there was a 20, with a decrease in, uh, or body checking policies, or sorry, body, body checking policies in hockey, um, they looked at different studies and they showed up to a 20 to 90% decrease um, with individual exposures. 
And then same with head contact um, penalties. Uh, if it was more strict, um, they found that there was a 36% risk reduction. Uh, and this was all in the NHL at the professional level as well. And then for soccer, um, they found that again, it wasn't a rule change, but being stricter and giving a red card for, for high elbow um, or yeah, high elbows to the head, um, those were going to be red cards. And that showed to once they start being a little more strict with that, they saw a 19% decrease in uh, concussion risk. Bro, oh, what are you doing? I'm just going to mute him. All right. Uh, <laughs> uh, looking at rule changes again, looking at the high school. So this is a really good study. This is kind of the study that uh, Carl joined us for. And it's why I invited Carl, because he had a really good insight on this. But we, uh, this study looked at uh, Wisconsin high school football. And they looked at the two years before rule changes were made. And then they looked at the year after rule changes were made to see the incidence of concussions. The rule changes they had was there was no competition or full contact in week one. At week two, they were allowed 75 total minutes of contact, excluding scrimmages. And then week three and after, um, they permitted 60 minutes of contact. And full contact is uh, full speed with contact where collisions do not have predetermined winners. Um, we can get into that later, but you could see how someone could say, well, what defines a winner and what defines predetermined? Um, so there, there can be flaws with this. Um, but the result was that the, of course, with in practices, the incidence was significantly lower because you're just taking away, uh, you're taking away contact um, with with full pads. But interestingly, when you look at the overall incidence, there was no significant um, differences there. So that might get your brain stirring on questions of whether rule changes do help or not. And then looking at the NCAA, uh, primarily in the Ivy League, they looked at limited contact practice allowed. Um, but the biggest thing they found was like a new kickoff rule in NCAA and um, basically it resulted in more touchbacks and that resulted in 81% less concussions. And this was a study by Harvard, I believe. And in the NFL, they've uh, taken steps to change rules such as moving the kickoff um, back or sorry, um, up five yards and then the blocking rules. And then of course the controversial helmet initiating tackling rules. Aside from that, the reporting issues could be different too. So uh, Dr. Ball from Colorado published this uh, ahead of print this, this month actually. And um, they looked at really staff reporting finances and um, patients per athletic trainer for their studies to try to find information. And honestly, it's a lot of information. If you read it, it it's hard to make sense of everything. But one thing they did point out was if you see this, the low staff means that there are a lot of, or there's not many athletic trainers to the proportionally to the graduate students and GAs, um, or sorry, GAs and athletic training students. Um, yet, if you look at overall concussions, um, there was actually more concussions in the group that had more trained athletic trainers. Um, and then similarly looking at this one, low patient load means that um, there is a lot of athletic trainers in proportion to the number of student athletes. Um, and high patient load is the opposite. And again, you'll notice in overall, it's kind of contradictory of what you would think. There's actually more concussion reports um, when you're better staffed with athletic trainers. And, and this one in their discussion really was talking about if it might be a reporting issue that uh, more experienced staff are gonna be more likely to report um, concussions. So it might come down to staff reporting of concussions, which kind of makes the research kind of weird. As far as athlete reporting, um, there's always a question of are, are athletes gonna uh, report accurately. So looking at this, um, you could see that uh, on this first graph, overall, uh, rugby players understand that the what concussions are, how they present, and how the severity of them, how it's going to affect them. But looking at this, especially at the bottom part, a lot of them feel that probably about one in every two people feel that um, they're going to let down their, their uh, teammates if they play. Well, these same people that think they're, they're going to let down their teammates actually feel like they don't care if their teammates get a concussion and miss it. So there's a disconnect of um, perception that people actually don't, your teammate does not care if you sit out because of concussion because they understand it, yet they may not report it because they're thinking they're letting their teammates down. And that just might be an education point when you talk to athletes who are eager to get back or um, you suspect they might be trying to hide a concussion as best as they can. So in summary, prevention methods seem to be all over the place. The biggest method uh, we have is probably rule change. 
Um, but really what goes into those rule changes? Uh, why do we continue doing certain methods that may not be evidence-based? Um, I think a lot of it comes down to safety of other injuries, um, such as helmets and mouth guards. So it's not that they're not effective in reducing concussions, but they're effective in reducing other stuff. And then is it realistic to prevent primary concussions? And is it realistic to prevent secondary concussions? Um, and that's all stuff we can, can learn from Carl as he goes into his data. And what Carl is a part of is a care consortium. So this is a joint group put together by the NCAA and the uh, Department of Defense. Uh, this was started in 2014 and they have the biggest cohort and database of impact and other concussion research. Um, this is the organization of 30 schools and institutions. Um, and this, they look at both co college athletes and also military. And as you can see in their publications list, they measure and study several different things and they assist other people too. So it's a, it's very, it's very joint friendly. Um, it's a joint collaboration that's very friendly towards working together. So how I knew about it was Wake Forest uh, advertises quite a bit and we have several staff on this consortium. Uh, I think our arm is basically uh, made for database collection. Uh, but Dr. Miles is the main coordinator for Wake Forest University. He's our family medicine and sports, uh, sports medicine specialist. And then Dr. Littner is over at Winston-Salem State University. Uh, Rich Birdie is the athletic trainer that was a coordinator at Wake Forest this year, helping to collect data. And then Carl was uh, the one last year. And I love Rich, it's not that I don't like Rich. Uh, it's, I, I chose Carl because he was there for the journal review of these articles. And uh, there's, there's two things that Carl gets pretty amped up about, and that's concussions and there's trivia. And trivia is out for now because bars are closed. So I figured Carl might enjoy coming on here to talk. That's Carl with the beard if you guys can recognize him. As usual, go Deeks. And uh, from here, I'm gonna go ahead and make Carl the host and he'll go over his knowledge. All right, Carl, the only one without a last name on here. Okay. Sorry about that. All right, Carl, it's all yours. All right. We're going here? Yeah, looks good. All right, sounds good. So first off, uh, I wanna say thanks to VN for uh, letting me uh, talk to you guys today. I mean, inviting me to talk to you guys today. Uh, it's, it's a big honor and uh, I think he's uh, selling me a little too highly, but uh, I'm very happy to be here and to share what I've learned from my time working with the, the Care Consortium at Wake Forest University. Uh, like I said, my name is Carl White. I'm an athletic trainer. Uh, currently, I'm working with the San Antonio Spurs. I'm the head athletic trainer for the G League team in Austin, the Austin Spurs, um, but I'm here because Last year, I was the Wake Forest University uh, Care Consortium Coordinator and also an assistant men's basketball athletic trainer at Wake. If I could get my slides to go. All right, so real quick, uh, going through what, what I'm gonna talk about today. Um, Hopefully I'm not gonna let VN down with uh, the 30,000 foot view, but uh, we're gonna talk briefly about some of the trends that he mentioned in, in injury detection, prevention and management. Um, and then we're gonna get a little more uh, specific and hopefully a little more practical in talking about the role of uh, biopsychosocial considerations in concussion management. Um, and that's, that's really something that, that I, began being interested in, you know, when I was uh, working with the CARE Consortium and, and conducting all these concussion tests. Um, and then hopefully at the end, you guys will be under, able to understand new recommendations for baseline and post-injury assessment. Uh, and, you know, you'll be able to think a little bit more critically about uh, psychological state, uh, in the influence of psychological state on concussion symptom reporting. And you'll be able to take some things out of this that, that you implement in, uh, in your practice and your management of concussions. So uh, first of all, oops, um, 
this is really just one slide of, of what VN just went through. Um, you know, I, I would say that, uh, again, multiple rule changes uh, have released, uh, reduced the frequency of head injury in American football. And we've seen that in other sports like rugby uh, and soccer as well, as VN mentioned. Um, current rule changes are, are being proposed uh, in, in multiple sports, especially sports like soccer and baseball and softball, where uh, the substitution rule is an elimination substitution, right? So if someone comes out of the game for a concussion assessment, they cannot return to the game. Uh, and I, I might be wrong here, um, but I believe that this upcoming uh, cycle in FIFA, they will be introducing a concussion sub, right? Which is you can substitute a player for up to 10 minutes of game time um, while you were conducting a concussion assessment on the potentially concussed player. And if that player is cleared to play, they can go back into the game. Um, so I think those rule changes, in addition to, you know, the, the high elbows rules and the moving the kickoff back, right, that, that are trying to reduce primary concussions, uh, the improved uh, time for assessment is, is going to be a big change uh, in reducing secondary concussions and not putting players on the field with uh, that, that may have concussions. Uh, so far, you know, in, in the efforts of concussion research, concussion education, we've seen uh, the, the biggest thing I would say is a significant increase in time to return to play uh, between a study the NCAA uh, conducted between 1999 and 2001 and uh, the first round of, of the CARE uh, study, CARE 1.0, which was uh, collected from 2014 to 2017. And, you know, I, I think that that goes a long way in reducing the, the horrible outcomes that we think about, right, with second impact syndrome um, being the, the most noteworthy and, you know, that accompanies the, the law changes, right, and uh, a number of the rule changes throughout uh, American football, especially. Um, like Vian mentioned, uh, in the Ivy League, they have been very proactive in, in trying to find uh, ways to reduce concussions. Um, and, you know, the, the most obvious being that, that they no longer tackle uh, in practice for 90% of their uh, competitive season. And, you know, sure enough, you tackle in if, if you don't tackle in practice, you're going to have fewer concussions. Um, there's a growing body of research supporting the safety and utility of early aerobic exercise in concussion management. Um, I think you guys can read that uh, in the AMSSM uh, physician statement, uh, consensus statement on concussion from 2019. And, and you guys are probably using that in your, uh, in your clinical practice already. Um, and there's moderate support for cervical and vestibular rehab in relieving symptoms. Um, and, you know, like Vian said earlier, we're not going to focus on, on treatment and management. Um, but, you know, you guys are, are probably much, much better educated about that than I am uh, because you, you're the ones doing the, the vestibular rehab. Um, but I, I think that's a great tool uh, for, for improving uh, the management of concussions. And then, you know, some of the things that Vian mentioned, the, the sensors, right, the accelerometers, either mouth guard studies or helmet studies, um, th those are ongoing for sure. And, and, you know, the more technology we have, the, the Q collars, the, the occlusion collars and, and the, you know, fMRIs, that, that stuff is all really great. And I think there are going to be, you know, countless gains in concussion uh, management over, over the next few years based on that research. But, um, you know, I, I don't think any of us have access to an fMRI or uh, a cue collar right now. So hopefully what I'm going to focus on today is, is some stuff that, that is a little more practical, um, you know, still, still taking a broad view of concussion, but uh, some things that you can take back to the clinic with you. So... Uh, in the CARE Consortium at uh, Wake Forest that Vian uh, introduced, uh, we were part of the arm, which was the clinical standard of care, right? There, there are two arms of the study, the advanced research, uh, ARC, uh, advanced research uh, group, and the uh, clinical standard of care group. 
And so, you know, what I did, I didn't do any fMRIs, but I did lots and lots and lots of concussion tests. Um, and we baselined every single athlete that we, that we had coming in uh, and everyone that consented to, to be part of the study. Uh, and it was a little bit more than a standard, you know, baseline concussion now uh, evaluation. We, we did the SCAT3, um, we did the, the impacts was our neurocognitive test and the neurocognitive test of the care consortium. And then uh, significant demographics, uh, the WTAR, the Wenchler test of adult reading, which is kind of like a IQ surrogate. Uh, we did VOMS and we did a, a pretty lengthy psychosocial battery uh, with every baseline. And uh, post-injury, we collected data at three time points, uh, 24 to 48 hours post-injury when they became asymptomatic and within 24 hours of their return to play. Um, and again, we did these same standard tests, right? That's, that's the SCAT3, that's the IMPACT, the WTAR. Uh, we also collected saliva, uh, looking for biomarkers in saliva is uh, one of the research aims of um, the CARE Consortium. And we did our bombs again, our psychosocial battery. Uh, my role was that, that I conducted all these assessments and then you know, I, I typed up a report and I sent it to the doctors and the athletic trainers, you know, for whichever team this athlete may be working with. And uh, I, I offered the, the quantitative data, right, and a little bit of qualitative assessment and, and my interpretation of the data. Um, and so, you know, a, as I went through, uh, I think I had 73 concussions at Wake Forest and uh, probably, you know, upwards of 200 baselines. Um, I, I really got more comfortable, um, you know, do, doing a little more uh, qualitative interpretation and, and really, you know, hopefully learn some good things about uh, how, how to best uh, conduct a concussion assessment. Uh, we also did an exit assessment too. Um, and that, that was as seniors were graduating. So when I was doing all these uh, concussion tests, you know, I was really kind of getting interested in the, the ideas of biopsychosocial management of musculoskeletal conditions, uh, specifically uh, low back pain and one low back pain patient I had. And, you know, again, I think you guys are probably much more, much better educated about that than I am. But uh, I, I was introduced to, to all this uh, research and, you know, CFT and, and things like that, that can be used in, in management of, of musculoskeletal conditions. And I began to, to think about the concussions in, in this light. And, and I think that there, are, I noticed some things that, that I feel that we, you know, as clinicians can do a little bit better um, in, in our management of concussion. And, you know, I, I think the, the great thing about the CARE Consortium is it's a really broad study you know, there, there are going to be hundreds of papers that come out of it. And uh, so far, a lot of them have focused on, you know, the, the psychological uh, role, uh, the influence of psychological state in concussion, and, you know, just the, the practice of, of our data collection and how that can influence concussion reporting and concussion management. Um, and so, you know, again, you guys know about this, right? The, the growing body of research, uh, emphasizing the stress, influence of stress, coping, and social factors on pain, disability, and musculoskeletal practice. And, and you know, you, you have all these tools. We have all these tools for holistic management, the motivational interviewing, the, the screening of yellow flags. And I, I know that that's a growing uh, focus of, of musculoskeletal education. Um, and I think, you know, concussion is, is inherently a biopsychosocial injury, right? Uh, where, where you're having uh, emotional symptoms um, and, and you, you're, you know, being removed from your, your social support group, right? If, if you're taken out of practice and, and you, you know, if you've got such sensitivity to light that, you know, it's, you're going to have to stay in your room for a couple of days. Those, those are biopsychosocial concerns, if, if anything is. I mean, if, if we can think of low back pain as a biopsychosocial condition, I, I certainly think that uh, concussion is a biopsychosocial condition. And, you know, one thing that, that I think... I, I certainly wasn't educated on is, is using these same tools, the, the biopsychosocial framework, 
to apply to concussion management and how we can improve care by applying these principles. Um, and, and I argue that, that we can improve care. And uh, I think there's some great research that, that we're gonna talk about right now that shows that uh, these, these matter, um, these ideas matter in concussion management. So the first one is uh, the paper that VN set out uh, this week uh, by my friend Brenton Askin at, at the University of Florida. And uh, he uh, looked at differences in symptom reporting between the SCAT-3 and the SCAT-5. Um, the SCAT-3, uh, SCAT-3 and SCAT-5, by the way, uh, there is no SCAT-4. I didn't know that, I missed that until I read this paper, but uh, the, the, one of the main differences between the SCAT-3 and the SCAT-5 is that they switched the baseline symptom of evaluation between trait uh, symptoms versus state symptoms. So, so what that means is on the SCAT-3, when you, you went through your, your baseline evaluation and your symptom evaluation, it said, uh, how do you feel right now on a scale of zero to six, you know, rate your headache, your pressure in head, on and on. Um, and on the SCAT-5, after the uh, fifth international concussion meeting, uh, they, they moved that to a, a trait symptom, right? How do you usually feel? How do you feel on a typical day? Um, and, you know, I think that, that the, the very small distinction there, right, the way we ask that question makes a huge difference. And that's what Breton, uh, Dr. Askin saw in, in his paper here, right? Um, that, that there was very, uh, there was only a moderate correlation between, you know, someone's answer when you ask them, how do you feel right now? And how do you usually feel? Right, and I think that that has huge implications for how we conduct baselines, and uh, you know just how we develop our ideas about about what someone's baseline is, and and how we can best return them to quote unquote normal, you know, as they return to play. Um, there's previous research that says the pre symptom pre injury symptom reporting, so baseline symptom reporting and mental illness are the most consistent predictors of risk of persistent post-concussion symptoms, right? So if they have concu concussion symptoms before they have a concussion, right, that is the most consi consistent predictor of risk of having persistent symptoms after a concussion. So, you know, that's, you really got to tease out whether, uh, whether those symptoms are concussion symptoms um, or, you know, if, if those, uh, if those symptoms, you know, those persistent symptoms that, that we view as concussion symptoms are not just, you know, sort of symptoms of a, of a mental illness or a psychological state uh, imbalance that, that is uh, causing them to, to report those things. And so you, you see here that, that uh, this, this data is pretty messy um, for, for just a very small change in how we ask the question. And, and I think, that is a great change, right? That, that we can, if, if we are able to recognize the distinction between how you feel right now and how you typically feel, that's, that's gonna help us guide our, our management for sure. Another thing I loved about this paper um, was that they didn't stop there, right? They, they asked qualitative questions about why you may feel this way, right? If, if this is a baseline exam and you're reporting symptoms, why do you, why do you uh, report these symptoms? And so in their athletes at the University of Florida, you know, the, the top three responses for why they're reporting symptoms, why they, they feel you know, the, the concussion-like symptoms that they're feeling is that they're tired, right? They, they are having issues with their sleep. Um, and, and we certainly know that athletes have, have a intense schedule and, and that is a, a common place where uh, shortcuts are made, right? Uh, another one is adjusting to college, right? Uh, oftentimes, the first thing you do if you're an athlete and you get to school, right? You have your athletic physical and then, you know, whatever else comes with it. And, and that's for, for uh, most schools, I would say that that is the, the concussion tests as well. Um, and then stress anxiety, right? Uh, there, there are, uh, you know, it's completely predictable that, that someone that is entering a new athletic season, entering a new school, uh, going from high school to college, right, is, is extremely stressed out in that situation. Um, and, you know, 
now we have uh, we have good good data that shows that these issues you know cause them to report concussion like symptoms. Um, and and I think asking these questions right whether it's on a baseline or whether it's a post injury is is really key in in how we care for concussions right if someone comes to you and they've got a, a symptom score, they report eight symptoms for you know a symptom score of 20 on their baseline. I think that that should be a, a, a cue that, that you're gonna ask them and you're gonna say, wow, you know, that's 20 symptoms or eight, eight symptoms, 20 score, you're probably not feeling very well, right? What, what can we do? You know, what, what how, how can I help you? Um, I, I would say, and then post-injury, I think this is the exact same thing. Um, you know, I don't have any research to support this, um, but one of my least, uh, one of my biggest pet peeves in concussion management is, you know, I, I see clinicians that, that hand, hand the patient the, the symptom evaluation and the patient goes down and they circle all their little scores and they hand it back to the clinician and the clinician says, oh, okay, and files it away and, and the patient leaves, right? I, I think that that is... We, we can do better than that. Um, and and we, can, we can begin to qualita qualitatively interrogate some of those symptoms, right? Um, that, that if uh, you're, you know, someone walks in and they're reporting a, a four out of six dizziness uh, post, post injury, you know, well, wow, that's pretty dizzy. What, what, uh, what do you think made you so dizzy? You know, are, are you this dizzy all the time? Was it, you know, the car ride coming over here that made you dizzy? You know that kind of qualitative uh, evaluation. I mean, at, at the very least, I think it it makes the the patient feel more cared for, um, and and we know that 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 is important in their recovery. Um, but I, I really think you can you can tease out uh, a lot more important information um, than you can if if you're just you know adding up the symptom score and and that's the end of your evaluation. Uh, so moving on to another paper that I think we're going to send out. Uh, this is, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to probably screw up the name. I don't know if it's Weber or Weber. Um, but uh, she, she wrote a great paper uh, on the influence of mental illness uh, and psychological state on assessment performance at baseline. Uh, and so, you know, I think this, this further uh, proves the, the enmeshment of uh, Psychological state, you know, mental illness, the, those type of concerns, the biopsychosocial concerns, and the the concussion assessment that we're doing. Um, and this is this is a, another care uh, study uh, paper. And so, you know, the the first thing uh, that that she found was that history of anxiety, depression, or anxiety with depression. Uh, patients with that history reported more concussion-like symptoms and more severe concussion-like symptoms. So a greater number of symptoms and a higher severity of symptoms at baseline on the SCAT-5 symptom evaluation. Uh, and you know, that, that, that right there is important in itself, right? That, that we know that these people uh, that, that are the, the most consistent predictor of risk of persistent uh, concussion symptoms is having a higher score at baseline. And you know, now we know that having a mental illness of anxiety, depression, or anxiety with depression, uh, they are more likely to report more symptoms, right? So you know, is, is risk mitigation starting at the beginning here? And, and if you've got someone reporting you know, uh, symptoms at baseline, or they're reporting their history of anxiety and depression, you know, is getting them in psychological care right away, is that a method of, of concussion risk mitigation? And I, I think it certainly could be. Um, another finding from that paper was that athletes reporting greater BSI-18 subscores had poor performance on impact verbal memory and visual motor speed. And so, you know, not only is this a, a subjective issue, right, the, the symptoms that they report, um, but the, uh, the greater BSI 18 subscores in, you know, somatization and anxiety and depression um, it actually led to poor performance on the, the impact screening, right? And so, you know, some of the, some of the testing that, that we may have looked at as either symptomatic 
uh, you know, a, emblem, uh, a, a symptom of their concussion um, may, may really, you know, certainly have, have some influence in their psychological state at the time, right? The, the, their psychological state can actually limit their performance on these tests. Um, and the, the third finding from this paper was that athletes uh, that have reported a greater number of concussions reported greater psychological distress on the VSIA team. And so uh, another, you know, link in the chain that, that complicates the, the relationship between psychosocial state and concussion. Uh, and, you know, the, the more concussions that you've, you've had, the, the more likely you are to report psychological distress. And so I, I think that, you know, this supports, again, pre-injury, um, using your, your tools, your, your referral to, uh, to help with the psychological distress and, and post-injury, you know, the same thing, that, that we know the concussion and psychological distress are, are intricately related and, uh, and we want to attack both heads, I think, uh, in, in best care. So uh, I did all these concussion tests, right? I, I did hundreds and hundreds, and um, I think that throughout the course of it, uh, I, I definitely learned a lot in in how to interpret and and what kind of you know Im impressions I can draw from from this quantitative data. Um, and the the body of research is supporting you know number one that uh, symptom evaluation does not need to and may never reach zero. Right. If if your goal is for that that SCAP five symptom evaluation score to, to go down to zero symptoms and you know zero severity, I I think that 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 uh, is a goal that may never be reached in a number of patients. Um, some recent research has defined asymptomatic as at eighty five percent of baseline symptoms. Um, you know I think there is some issue with uh, with calculating that um, and so. That's actually a, a question I have for, for some of the papers I've read uh, that, that define asymptomatic as 85%. But I, I think that that is, is just, you know, an acknowledgement of the fact that people report symptoms at baseline, right? And so we shouldn't expect them to not report symptoms after they recover from a concussion. Um, you know, if, if we know that stress impacts uh, baseline symptom reporting, uh, you know, certainly concussion is a stressor and the, the return to play process is a stressor and we, we, we can accept that uh, asymptomatic may never happen in some portion of the population. Um, another great uh, paper by Dr. Askin out of Florida uh, looked at the, the SCAT5 battery and you know, how, how we diagnose concussion and how we determine that someone is ready to advance, ready to remove, uh, return to play. Um, like anything else in, uh, in our practice, I think uh, what they found is that, that the uh, multi-dimensional assessments, you know, combining all of the tests we have uh, offers the greatest clinical utility. Um, and looking at the raw scores is helpful, looking at the change scores, uh, certainly as someone progresses over time is, is going to be very helpful. Um, one little interesting finding from that paper is that balance assessments uh, using the best may not be useful um, in, in diagnosis when other assessments are available. Um, certainly, you know, things like uh, symptom evaluation and uh, neurocognitive screening are, are the first line of uh, evaluation and diagnosis. Um, but probably the the most important thing to to come out of this uh, paper is that that single impaired scores on impact neurocognitive metrics uh, occur in approximately nine percent of the population at baseline, right? And and so just like patients report symptoms at baseline, patients also have poor impact metrics at baseline, right? Um, and so if, if you are holding someone from returning to play because their reaction time isn't, you know, they, they've got four good metrics, but their reaction time is not quite up to snuff, right? Or, you know, their impact is great. The, the rest of the SCAT battery is great, but, you know, their balance is not, is, is you know, four errors below their, their baseline. I, I think that what this data from, from CARE is finding is that 
you know, there, there is a lot of variation in those tests. And if we're using a multi, multi-dimensional assessment, right, we, we have to consider the idea that one dimension of that assessment uh, is, is not enough reason to, to be holding someone back from, you know, progressing their, their graduated return to play or returning to play because these, these poor scores on single dimensions of that assessment are pretty common at baseline in a healthy population. So uh, here, here are some of my, my own ideas about, you know, how, how we can incorporate this context, this, you know, link between psychosocial conditions uh, and, and concussion assessment uh, in, into our own practice and, and how we can improve the way we can care for concussions this way. Um, number one, I think you have to assess psychosocial state at baseline and at post-injury assessments, right? Um, if, if someone is, is reporting a poor psychosocial state, a high BSI-18 score, high uh, number and severity of concussion symptoms at baseline, you know, do you consider that a, an accurate baseline? Um, is, that, is that the marker that we want to use when we are determining if they are safe to return to play? Um, you know, I, I think that, that we need to have a quick trigger, a heightened suspicion for referral for concussion patients um, or patients with a concussion history to our psychological teams, right? Um, whether that be your sports psychologist, whether that be student health psychologists, you know, or if you're, you're out in the clinic, um, uh, some sort of uh, psychological help, because we know that, you know, people with concussions uh, have, have a uh, report a greater BSI-18 scores and greater BSI-18 scores uh, are likely to lead to symptom reporting and symptom reporting is likely to prolong concussion recovery. And so, you know, it's, it's a big mess of data, um, but, but I think that, that we really can't go wrong with uh, referral and, and helping, uh, helping the patients or, or doing everything we can to help these patients with uh, the psychosocial concerns. Uh, again, I think the qualitative analysis of symptoms is key. Right, that that you are you're looking at that symptom score and and you're saying, you know, wow, this is this is uh, this is unusual. You know, your 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 nausea went up a whole lot today. You know, and not taking that as just a natural ebb and flow in the course of a concussion. And and I think you you find that when you ask those questions, they say, oh yeah, you know, I I had a big night last night, or you know, I I. I uh, ate some Thai food at lunch, and I think that's what's getting to my nausea. Um, and I really, if you're just having the, the patient fill out that symptom evaluation form, I, I think you're missing a lot of really important data uh, in their, in their um, progression. Um, this is a quote from that Weber paper. Uh, Clinicians may be holding patients to post-injury standards that they may never be able to achieve if comparing a person to anxiety, depression, or anxiety with depression to normative data. Um, when I was a grad student at the University of North Carolina, I worked with our club sports program, and uh, I had a, a patient uh, on the Quidditch team, and we didn't have baseline concussion tests on the Quidditch team, but you know, she came in for, I, I don't know, probably three months um, reporting concussion symptoms, right? And I, I was, uh, it, it was tough to say that uh, she wasn't having concussion symptoms, right? Because we didn't have a baseline for her. And it's hard to return to play Right, if we expect that that symptom evaluation is going to get down to zero. Um, and so I think we need to adjust our, our ideas of what is, what is normal, what is asymptomatic, right? and, and acknowledge that normative data um, in patients that we don't have baselines for is not going to be you know, that, that zero symptom score, uh, zero symptoms, zero uh, severity. Um, and then lastly here, significant psychological distress at baseline could cause underperformance and non-representative scores, right? Um, 
that that is uh probably the most significant thing i saw at wake forest right uh oftentimes there was a time crunch to get this concussion testing done so that the the athletes could get to practice um specifically i remember we had a, a plane full of australian runners that that flew in for 30 hours um to get to wake and you know we got to rush them through their physical we got to rush them through the concussion test um and so that they can get on a bus to go to the team to a training trip in the mountains right um and i think that obviously right the a number of kids that haven't slept in in 30 hours is that going to be a good baseline test um and and i think we really need to think critically about like what is the clinical utility of of testing them at this time right when do we need to repeat this baseline test um to to allow for for their schedule to normalize you know the jet lag to wear off um and and them to to adjust a little bit um i i think that 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 would really provide a much more accurate baseline which which would help us more accurately you know guide their return to play So that's what I got here. Um, thanks uh, again for, for VN and, and for you guys for listening. Hopefully you, you can take some uh, practical applications and, and just some things to think about. Um, and I'm excited to, to sit here and, and you know, discuss this with you guys, uh, answer any questions that, that you may have um, that, that I can help with either, either about the care consortium or you know, about concussion as a whole. Um, and uh, thanks again. Thanks, Carl. Carl, I, I, uh, there's nothing in the chat right now besides me saying that equal care for all for the Quidditch kids. Um, but my first question is, so at a high school last year, they did concussion baseline testing at freshman and junior year. And you kind of mentioned that the context of when you take it is important. Would there ever be value in like with the more quantitative scores, averaging them versus those two years, or are they developing so much in those years that you want to take the most recent? That's a great question. Um, I, I think that definitely development um, is, is an important factor as well, right? Uh, that, that a freshman in high school and a junior in high school are, are going to be thinking pretty differently. Um, and, and so, you know, I, I would probably recommend even baselining more frequently than that, if possible. Um, you know, but pediatric concussion care is, is not uh, an area that I am very familiar with. Um, but I, I think that there's some, some really good research out there uh, considering those areas. All right, thanks. And then um, as a data for, as a whole, would you say there was a high proportion who actually did meet 100% of their baseline testing or not many at all? Uh, yes. I, I would say yes, that, that the majority of, of concussion patients I saw, right, were number one, they were symptom free at baseline, or they had a very, very low symptom score at baseline, and they returned to being symptom free, and they met all of their, you know, uh, SAC and BESS and impact scores to, to return to play. And I, I think that those, that, that's obviously the the you know ideal concussion recovery, um, but I think if if that is our only guideline, right, we are going to be holding a lot of people out for a lot longer than they need to uh, if we're not able to acknowledge that you know some people just have concussion symptoms when they are perfectly healthy, um, and and the psychological state plays a plays a big role in that. Thanks. One more question before I give others a chance. I'm going to hog the mic. Um, so we know with uh, medical disqualifications in NCAA, a lot of it might depend on the number of concussions someone has. Um, do you see like their scores factoring in? Say they had one concussion, but their scores aren't getting better. Is there a threshold on when medical disqualification may come into talk? Yeah, that, that is uh... – that is the million dollar question for sure. Um, I, I think the number one factor in considering medical disqualification is 
the duration of their symptoms, right? And and the impact that the concussion plays, you know, the the um, short form twelve, right? The their disability um, in in their activities of daily living is is the the first uh, consideration. Um, I think that certainly the the psychology of it uh, applies as well, and and um, I, I would definitely want uh, the the care team, right? The the physicians, the athletic trainers, the physical therapists, you know, the sports psychologists, whoever else is is coming to this, you know, recommendation with with the patient and their family and whatnot um, to consider uh, their the effect of of their concussion history on their psychological state. Okay. And Carl, should the NFL get rid of the helmet, leading with the helmet rule? I'm just kidding. Uh, if anyone had, can, wants to start asking questions, they can. I, I got a few more questions, but I'll wait. Uh, I'll jump in. And I guess this is opening up for more discussion than anything. Um, you know, I appreciate that the number of concussions are probably going to be reduced um, with, uh, you know, limiting the practices and limiting hitting and practices that the Ivy League's doing. But... I also think that there's probably a slippery slope there as far as, you know, you're re reducing the exposure, sure, but are you reducing the amount of exposures to the demands of the sport? And are you underpreparing individuals to then go out and play an intense sport, contact sport, in, a, in an emotional state, one that might be elevated on game day when, you know, 50,000 people are in the stadium, versus that practice where it's a little bit more relaxed, typically. I mean, sometimes those practices can get pretty emotional and pretty intense. Um, and I, I just think that, you know, it, it, if you're not going to take tackling out of football, I'm not sure if you can completely take tackling out of practice because I think you're probably doing somewhat of a disservice to the motor control and the, the demands of learning how to accept the tackle and to be tackled. Um, so I was curious on that. I just don't think it's, you know, I applaud the Ivy League for trying to do something different, but I'm not sure if it's going to be beneficial in the long term. So I was curious to get everybody's thoughts on that. Yeah, I think that's that's a you know very valid concern, um, and you know, you wonder what what happens with uh, with other injuries. Uh, throughout the body, right? If, if they've got poor tactical playing technique um, or, you know, just they're unaccustomed to, to that contact. Um, I, I think you could argue, right, that, that these college football players have, have done plenty of tackling on, on their way to college. And, you know, similarly to, you know, working in pro basketball right now, we, we don't practice very much, right? Um, because practice is less important in our in our game preparation, um, maybe you can argue that that practicing tackling is is less important or practicing live tackling. I, I as far as I understand, right? They do plenty of dummy drills and controlled tackling and things like that. But um, I, I think that 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 is a that is a great point and you know something that we're going to have to consider from, from Ivy league football going forward. Um, hard part is that Ivy league is, is not the sec. Right. Um, and we're, we're not really able to see, uh, those, those differences, you know, on, on the TV on Saturdays. Yeah. And it, it's interesting because I know the Ivy league is working with the big 10 in some degree. I think there's a symposium every year that's going on. Um, I just, you know, if, if tackling's involved, I, as far as just like even, you know, it gets back to like um, some of the work that, um, and we're actually going to talk about this uh, next week, but the, uh, Dustin Groms and he's doing like anticipatory reactions for like ACLs and, you know, is your motor control enough post-surgically? Are we always worried about the strength too much? And a lot of their studies um, have focused on MRIs studies that have come in from the University of Cincinnati and just showing that there's that that deficit in subcortical levels of muscle activation and I just I think if you don't have those systems and you don't know what it's like to be tackled and then to put you in, in that intense environment I just 
there's some, and, and that's going to be so difficult to tell what level that should be at. You know, like I, I understand maybe limiting the Oklahoma drill, but I, I just think, and it, it, to your point too about um, they've received tackling. I just think too, like these individuals that are coming into college, some of them are still skeletally maturing and going through things. Um, I think about the kid from Dayton this year, Obi Toppin. and they said that he grew like five inches between I, that's a random guess what he grew but I knew he grew a lot um and even Zion you know with us last year they say that he filled out really quick um so I think they're still developing neuromuscular and I just I, I still think they need to be exposed to those demands of sport somehow so I don't I don't think just taking it out and expecting it to be um a big part of their sport is, is the 100% best answer so Aaron, this is coming from a football athletic trainer perspective, but um, when you take some of the live tackling out, a lot of the drills are still thud drills. So you're still practicing body position and uh, anticipating contact and kind of squaring up and getting your body in the correct position. So if you're doing thud drills effectively, then you're just taking out that additional risk of, you know, taking someone to the ground and hitting their head on the ground or potentially injuring another body part in the live drills. And Ryan, to speak on that too, um, I think that uh, mentioning the systematic review about technical proficiency um, kind of challenged me a little bit because I, I agree with you that I think they need the reps to do that, but they showed that those who had technical proficiency in rugby at least, didn't, it didn't transfer over to games. And the two thought process I had from that was even in practice, I mean, games are way more intense, so are they even getting quality reps in practice? Um, but the other side of that too is, um, if for me, I'm thinking about from another context of me, and this is where it came from Carl with that study where it showed that even though they restricted uh, contact practices in high school football, the incidence of overall concussions was the same. And we kind of started talking about, well, you could have those decreased amount of time, but you could have a coach that's pissed off due to past season or during a past game saying, all right, we're just going to take these 60 minutes and go as hard as we can. I want you guys to hurt each other kind of thing, you know, like you, you have those attitudes that still persist. Um, so my other side of that is, um, I think overall, I think maybe going into like the workload context, but not just a gradual over the week, but within session, like how much people are getting quality reps of intensity of hits and also how that can skew the data um, with incidents, even though time of contact has decreased, if that makes sense. Yeah, it definitely does. Um... I, when I was at the University of North Carolina for grad school, uh, working football, uh, we, we had a preseason coming off a, a poor season and the, the general consensus from the coaches was that we needed to get tougher and that meant that we needed to tackle more, right? And, you know, while there have been all these uh, rule changes in how, how many practices you can have in a preseason, you know, you can't have two a days, uh, can't have more than six practices in seven days or, or however that, that is set up, um, that, you know, that, that intensity, um, still, still leads to, to concussions, right? Um, it, it's not just about reducing, reducing time of practice. It's definitely about, you know, focusing on, on those, those thud drills and, and things like that and trying to find the best ways to, to maximize your performance um, and and also, you know, keep everybody safe. Yeah, I think Corona is going to be definitely interesting because there are talks of potentially bringing back two days to make up for time lost. And I want to see what this new, I mean, because a lot of coaches, not only with um, sports med, but a lot of coaches are buying into the player load of uh, GPS monitoring. Um, so I want to see if two days are going to be the same two days or it's going to be actually way, like way less intense practices, um, but more conditioning per se. So I think it's going to be interesting times. Um, hopefully not if football comes back, but when football comes back. I was curious if anybody had any thoughts on um, strength training for neck musculature as a preventive measure. Um, if anybody was on the uh, Andrews talk last night, they they discussed it. Um, yeah, I, I remember reading about it maybe five years ago. I had a project surrounding it, but I was curious if anything else has came out recently with 
anything focusing on that. I think at Wake for the football players, it's a part of their overall uh, potentiation phase of their lifting. So they'll do it anyways. I don't know if it's specifically for um, concussion risk reduction. Maybe Ada can answer that. By the way, Ada is the athletic trainer at Wake Forest for football. Um, they, they do multiple types of strengthening. They'll do um, manual resistance with a partner. Um, to get the eccentric phase as well. And then they also have traditional neck machines. Um, and, you know, some of the thought is to have better head control and prevent against injury. But that's a standard part of all of the strength training, I think, at most football programs at, you know, high school level and up across the country. Yeah, that, that's a great question, Ryan. Um, definitely uh, something that, that – I would want to read, read more about. Um, but I think that so far, you know, all, all the data that, that I've been exposed to has, has showed that to be fairly inconclusive. But um, I, I think there was a paper uh, that, that came out of North Carolina that showed that neck strengthening can reduce uh, the, the forces absorbed, right? It's a, it's a helmet study, the, the linear and uh, rotational acceleration. Um, and, you know, that, that is probably a, a good start, but uh, looking at the linear and rotational acceleration, we also know that there is no threshold, right? That it, it's not that if you keep your your linear acceleration under 100 Gs, you know, you're not going to get a concussion, right? You, you can have concussions at, at 15 Gs and you can have concussions at, at 100 uh, and, and 50. But um, I, I think that, that that is definitely a, a really good theory and, and more, uh, more research needs to be done in that area. My thoughts on it too is there may be inconclusive evidence, but it's super quick to do. And at worst, they're going to get their neck stronger. Yeah. And I think they're, when you're, when you're treating these acutely, these concussion um, diagnoses, I, a lot of people manual therapy for cervicogenic symptoms. And I definitely think there's a role in that, but I also think there's a role in uh, strengthening the neck musculature, even in those acute phases. And I think when athletes are more predisposed to that before an injury, and then you're coming back and doing the same exercises, it gets back to the whole, they're still having uh, a stimulus that they're familiar with and they're feeling like an athlete and they're back in their athletic training. So I, I definitely think it has a role, um, whether it moves the needle or not, as far as hundred percent preventing concussions, I think, anecdotally to your point, um, after an injury, it can just get them back into their usual training a little bit faster as well. Hey, Carl, who do you think can uh, help high school athletic trainers take baseline data? I know they're swamped and um, they see hundreds of kids at a time. And they, I, from the folks I hung out with at Wisconsin, they do try their best to talk about go deeper dive into the symptoms, but it, it's just hard manpower wise. There's one per school usually. Right. Yeah. The next profession. I, um, sometimes our primary care does it too, but is there any other health professional that you think should take the job on? Uh, that, that is a, a great question. Um, you know, I, having been tangentially exposed to some high school studies at UNC, um, I, I know that the the athletic trainers that we worked with were were very excited to have you know graduate students and doctoral students coming to to help them do their baseline testing, um, and so hopefully you know expanding the the research base to to not just you know high schools around research institutions, um, but you know I I think that. If we if we view the the baseline assessment as you know not not the end all be all of okay we've done it it's done right if if even if even if the the best way you can do it is you take your your single athletic trainer your two athletic trainers and you've got a classroom full of fifty kids that are all doing the test on their computer um, that you know emphasizing the importance of 
that athletic trainer, like at, at least scrolling through the results and, and, you know, flagging the, the ones that, that, uh, report high symptom scores or, you know, have particular, uh, you know, worrisome BSI 18s or PHQs or whatever, you know, psychological analysis they're doing, um, would, would go a long way in improving the quality of baselines. Thanks, Carl. And Carl, I'm going to wrap up now, but can you go ahead and make me host again, please? Absolutely. Um, so thanks everyone for joining. Um, this was a pretty cool topic that I liked because I know a lot of times we just kind of go through the clinical practice guideline and go over vestibular stuff. So I just want a different perspective. Uh, thank you, Carl. Um, but that wraps up the concussion series and we're going to go with this whole seminar series in general. We're going to go for um, at least another three weeks and Ryan's going to kind of talk about what the plans are ahead. Yeah, so uh, next week it'll be myself and um, some biomechanists from Duke uh, talking about ACL, cause of injury, and etiology. Um, Duke has a really great lab looking at um, uh, x-rays as well as some other imaging studies, um, like high-speed x-rays, and they're trying to basically image what the um, ACL and what the knee position is uh, at time of injury. So, and it's, it's a really great presentation. So I'm really excited to have individuals from that group on. Um, and I'll be talking about some clinical correlations to that. And then the next week, uh, myself and Liz Flannerly are going to be talking again about um, basically high, um, high athletic um, ACL uh, rehabilitation and optimal loading, as well as uh, some advanced cutting um, thoughts and uh, drills that we can do in, in uh, late season uh, or late uh, term rehabilitation. Um, and then after that, we're going to get into some uh, upper extremity talks with Niles from Wake Forest. Um, so it'll be uh, hopefully a good three weeks going back to the lower extremity and then kind of going back up to the upper extremity. And we'll, we'll keep going as long as we can and as long as our schedules allow. Um, please reach out to me or VN uh, if you're interested in pre presenting after that. Um, we like to get more upper extremity stuff in, maybe a little bit more elbow, a little bit more hand things that I think we don't necessarily see too often, but happen a lot in uh, sports. So thank you all for your time again. We appreciate you guys being on here. Thanks everyone.